Tom Taylor, Jay Christoph, C.S. Packard, Caspar Wingard, Sean Isaacs, and Michelle Bandini all expand the Three Kingdoms with a series of stories involving the next generation of superpowered kings and queens. Tom Taylor, Jay Kristoff, and C.S. Picard expand the Dark Knights of Steel world with three wonderful stories that flesh out some of the young kings and queens and digs into how they got to the point they are in the main series. Tom, being the creator of the series, delivers a fun little adventure that sees the royal children save some of their subjects from a nefarious experimentation happening at Arkham, while also building out more of the supporting cast we've seen a little bit of in the main book, mainly Jimmy Olsen. Jay Kristoff explores how the Batman meets his Robin while also showcasing a very classic quote-unquote world's finest bit between Cal and Bruce, with both learning something a little bit important about each other as well as the people around them. And finally, C.S. Picard explores Bruce's dislike for magic and how he became the cold and uncaring to those who use it or are affected by it, tying it into the classic Batman story beat of him travelling the world and honing his abilities with the greatest warriors of the world, and at times, using that training he has learned from them against them to get the better of them. All three of these stories brilliantly expanded the lore and world of the Dark Knights of Steel universe, informing on already active story beats in the main series, and if General Waller's bit in Tom's story at the beginning is anything to go by, will also end up influencing some upcoming story beats in the main book, making this essentially a must read if you want to follow that part of the story. Caspar Wingard, Sean Isaacs, and Michelle Bandini lend their immense artistic talents to the anthology, each perfectly adapting their respective writers' scripts with great colour, action, and character beats. Design-wise, the series continues to breathe new life into these characters who have existed for decades, giving them some fun redesigns that invoke the characters' classic costumes, while also making them fittingly medieval. Michelle Bandini also gets a few extra points from me by essentially making Bane, or the King's Bane, literally just guts from the anime Berserk, complete with accurate black swordsman armor and the giant hunk of iron sword he carries. It just looked fantastic and it completely makes sense for a character like Bane. I can't believe I've never actually thought of that and put two and two together, that Bane is basically guts from Berserk. It's, it fits it so well and Michelle and CS did a really good job of bringing that to life. Dark Knights of Steel, Tales from the Three Kingdoms, Issue 1, was a brilliant little collection of stories that expand Tom Taylor's fantasy spin-off of the DCU in some fun directions, fleshing out the main character's arcs a little more while also teasing the future of the series with some cool new story plot points. I'm going to give this issue a 9.5 out of 10. Dark Knights of Steel, Tales from the Three Kingdoms issue 1 heads to the Arkham Orphanage in the L Kingdom, where James Olsen says his goodbyes to his best friends Harvey Dent and Oswald Cobblepot, apologising for leaving. The children are glad to see him go, since at least one of them has escaped from the hellhole. James is soon presented to Mr. and Mrs. White, with Perry asking if the boy will help him at the press. James is taken in by Perry and his wife, gifted a telescope, knowing that the boy was always looking at the stars, so they just wanted to bring them a little closer for him. James soon spots something in the sky, telling his parents it was bigger than a bird, having blotted out the entire moon. His mother thinks it's time he's done sky watching and it's time for bed, but James returns to the roof, soon spotting the flying prince Cal, who apologises for scaring the boy. Cal introduces himself to James, who shows him the telescope. Knowing the prince can already see far distances thanks to his powers, but the telescope will help him see even further. Cal looks through the telescope and he sees the vastness of the universe above. James begins pointing out various constellations to him, wondering if they could see the planet Cal comes from, but Cal knows that planet is long gone, and James apologises, revealing his first home is gone as well, lost in the war, and his last home, the orphanage, is still there, but he wishes it wasn't. He's glad that both he and Cal have homes now, as a few weeks later, Perry approaches King Jor-El and Queen Lara, telling them that his son James was kidnapped from their roof a week ago, and he's not the only child gone missing, and four others have gone as well, also hearing rumours that more have been taken from Arkham Orphanage by some large winged creature. Jaw thinks that it's the Hawks of the Sky Kingdom, but Perry knows that it was something much larger than that. He knows his paper has criticised the elves before, but Lara knows that it's his job to question power, and their role is to use their power they have wisely and with compassion. Prince Cal watches through a wall in the next room, hearing that General Walla herself is going after the children. The prince decides to go after them as well, leaving the palace and gaining the attention 
attention of Prince Bruce, who later catches up to Cal on the orphanage roof, pointing out the talon marks on the roof tiles. Zala joins the duo, wanting to see this dragon that's kidnapping children. Bruce agrees that it's probably a dragon and Zala wants to ask Harvey and Oswald, who are watching them through a nearby window. Oswald invites them in, knowing that they are there for the monster and that while he never saw anything, Harvey sure did, but he can't decide anything at the moment since he's a bit stuck. Harvey begins ranting about opposites in the corner as Bruce offers him a golden Thomas coin, hoping that it will aid the boy since maybe the coin can help him choose his decisions. Harvey tells him that the monster took Waylon and it's something worse than a dragon. Cal asks where they flew to so Harvey flips the coin, telling them that they went to Mount Carmody. The trio head to the snow-capped peak and Bruce knows that the king and queen wouldn't approve of Zala hunting monsters and she should be sent home, but Zala reminds Bruce is the one who has been carried, whereas she can fly, just like the monster. They soon spot Jimmy's telescope in the snow and Zala finds a cave entrance in the mountain. Cal finds he can't see deep into the cave since there are too many twists and turns and the walls are lined with lead, but he can hear the children. Zala quickly takes off despite the boy's protests and runs right into Man Bat. Cal tries to attack the beast but it smashes him into the roof, knocking him and some of the ceiling down on the trapped children. Luckily Zala blasts the rubble with her heat vision, saving them as Bruce straddles the Man Bat, getting it to rear so Cal and Zala can both knock it down. Jimmy tells them to stop since it's not a monster, revealing that the Man Bat is actually Kurt Langstrom, a 12 year old boy who is his friend. He wasn't trying to hurt them, he was trying to save them from the orphanage. Bruce learns from Waylon that someone in the orphanage was experimenting on the children as the heroes learn it was Elizabeth Arkham as at the woman's lab General Waller storms in hitting Arkham in the shoulder with an arrow and arresting her telling the woman that she doesn't get to run from what she did to these children. King Jor-El meanwhile tells his children that they did well and while they definitely are in trouble for going off alone the children they found will be cared for and a great evil has been removed from the kingdom. Waller meanwhile transports Elizabeth to the dungeon but thinks that it would be a shocking waste of her talents if she rotted away in them, wanting to keep her doing what she was doing but this time in the service of the kingdom, not wanting to tell the king or queen since from now on Elizabeth Arkham works with General Amanda Waller. Five years later, Prince Cal leaves the castle with Harley Quinn, reminding her that she was not invited. Harley reminds him that she is advisor to the crown, but Cal knows he's not wearing the crown yet, and how can he hope to wear it well if he doesn't know his subjects, since the people see them as gods, and gods are often feared more than loved. Harley thinks that he's been talking to Bruce again, but Cal knows the boy is not wrong as Bruce appears in the tunnel with them. Cal knew he was there on account of his heartbeat, reminding him that it was Bruce who suggested he go and see the city. Bruce says that he's not there to stop Cal, instead wanting to join them, but Harley finds it funny since having him along will be less fun than being squeezed into the corset she has to wear. Bruce knows that he can be fun as Harley says he didn't bring a disguise, but Bruce doesn't think that Cal's spectacles are much of a disguise as he dons his own mask. The trio head into the city celebrating All Hallows Eve, blending in well with the other party goers as Harley tells Cal that the city is beautiful, but Bruce knows that every city has an ugly side. He tells Cal that the kingdom isn't perfect and there are rumours of a pack of thieves operating in the city and lawlessness is on the rise, something that they should sort out. Harley tries to defend the city but becomes distracted by a three-legged puppy as Bruce tells Cal that these are dark times. Cal trusts Bruce but knows that if the people are lost in the dark then it's their duty to show them the light. Harley meanwhile is bumped into by a cloaked being, suddenly realising that her necklace is gone. Cal and Bruce give chase to the cloaked man but more cloaked people begin to appear, confusing them as to who to go after. Bruce chases one of them down, finding that the boy is quick-footed even for him as he launches a grapple onto the roof evading the Dark Knight and impressing him. The boy, clad in a red, green and yellow costume now, flings some smoke pellets at Bruce, escaping into the street where he disrupts a horse and carriage, causing the horse to bolt in fear right into a young child. The boy diverts his swing to the child, scooping her up and saving her from being trampled. Bruce catches up to the boy, who thinks that the Dark Knight didn't get them all, however Prince Cal returns with the five other members of the Robins. Bruce says this is what he meant by Dark Times, since pickpockets have become bandits and bandits have become killers. The kids say that the Robins are not that and they don't hurt anyone, only stealing from people who can afford it. Bruce asks why they call themselves Robins, learning that they are building a nest from the coin they steal since not every orphan in the city gets to sleep in a 
a palace at night. Bruce realizes that the kids know who they are, so Bruce and Cal remove their disguises, and Cal reminds Bruce to show the kids some light. So Bruce approaches the one named Richard, asking if he would like a job, as Harley arrives with her new dog, offering the puppy up to Bruce for a hug. Years before in Hob Forest, Prince Bruce and his small guard company are attacked by the King's Bane, who cleaves a man in two with his giant sword. The guards try and protect Bruce, but all his men are killed, leaving only the young boy to face the black swordsman. Bane, however, kneels before the boy, calling him his king as Bruce tries to attack, but Bane catches his hand, knowing the boy cannot defeat him. Bruce demands the man stop calling him king, as Bane reveals that he knows Bruce is a bastard child, knowing that he was taught to stay in the shadows while the elves stand in the sun, but a boy with the Wayne blood has more right to the throne than any monsters on it now. Bane rises, telling the boy that when he's ready to take the throne, he is to come to the Inn of the White Stag. Bruce demands to know why he would ever go, so Bane tells him that it's because that he can show the boy how to kill a monster. Later at the Inn, Fiddler tells Bane that the boy isn't coming, probably because he's murdered his guard and attacked his supply lines for months. Bane thinks the boy will come since monsters with powers have to be stopped and Bruce knows that better than anyone else. Bruce does indeed turn up, and later that night, the King's Bane spars with the boy, telling him that to kill someone with powers it takes dedication and training, and you have to strike first from the shadows and take them when they least expect it. Bruce wants to learn how to fight like this, so Bane begins his training, and in the months that follow, he begins to learn Bane's ways, getting close enough to nick the man's helmet with his dagger. Bruce asks him one day why he wears the helmet, learning Bane didn't always, and he was once a palace guard who got to guard the Waynes, knowing that it was the best day of his life, but then the green man attacked and killed them and he couldn't protect them, but he'll see that the Wayne heir will sit on the throne. Bruce asks about the mask, so Bane explains that when his back was broken in the attack by the green man, a doctor named Crane found him and fashioned a mask for him, and while he despises the cursed green magic that pumps through it, it's the only thing keeping him standing. Bane reveals that he has taught the boy everything he can knowing that tomorrow they will kill the elves and restore him to the throne. Bane explains the simple plan as Bruce gets himself and the hooded Bane into the palace and into the royal court. Bane reveals himself properly, unleashing the magic that can kill the elves, but suddenly Bruce slashes his green tubing, cutting his magic supply and causing Bane to become crippled again. Bruce explains to the elves that he has captured the king's Bane who wanted to kill the elves and put Bruce on the throne, but Bruce refuses to lose more people he loves to magic and he won't let magic hurt anyone again. Bruce bows before the elves pledging his loyalty to the throne and that he will protect the elves from magic. Bane says that he taught the boy everything and Bruce doesn't deny it, and he will fight against monsters like the Green Man and the King's Bane. Bane continues to shout that he cannot trust the elves, as Bruce tells the guards that Bane was right and the kingdom is vulnerable to magic, so he is to be a lesson to anyone who dares challenge the throne with magic, demanding that the guards throw the King's Bane into the pit. 